Thanks again for having me, Todd. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this conference and uh, uh, enjoy Columbia in, in April. But uh, this just in, another JavaScript framework was released just a few <laughs> minutes ago. So this is uh, outdated. But uh, anyway, um, my name's Tom Wilson. I'm lead technologist of Jack Russell Software. We do healthcare, web-based technology, lots of forms, lots of bureaucracy, but we make it fun. <laughs> Uh, I love JavaScript and Node, CouchDB, and AngularJS. And what I want to talk to you a little bit about um, is AngularJS. And this is an um, introduction. Um, and you, you, some of you guys have, may have already used AngularJS um, before. And I'll try to address some stuff for you. But really, this is just for the people who really want to dig in and get started. And I'll first try to go through the what, why, and how, and then show some of the features of Angular, and then uh, wrap up with some questions. How many of you guys use JavaScript on a daily basis? So everybody, great, great. Can't get away from it, right? <laughs> um, so AngularJS is a JavaScript framework, and it's a front-end-based framework that is really meant to try to abstract away the direct ma manipulation of the DOM. Um, if you've used things like jQuery or some older libraries, um, they, they all help you manipulate the DOM. Angular takes a different stack uh, approach. It uh, tries to allow you to isolate the code that you want to manipulate the DOM and the code that you want to get stuff done with. And the DOM is the document object model for the browser. And uh, I think everybody uh, can tell that's worked with the DOM for a number of years can tell that it's a pain in the butt to work with. So Angular tries to solve that pain, and it does it with a couple of functionality features, two-way data binding, HTML templates, and dependency injection. So you might say, well, why AngularJS? There's a lot of other JavaScript frameworks out there that are trying to solve the same problem. Well, Angular focuses on writing simpler code. So when you go to build an application, Angular's framework really helps you break your application into small, simple pieces. Um, and it's easier to manage. You may have heard the term dry, uh, don't repeat yourself. Uh, Angular really helps you embrace that as a framework. And one of the biggest wins with Angular was when it was first being designed is its focus on testing and unit testing. Because your code is isolated and se separated, it's easier to do unit testing um, in a much you know, uh, treacherous environment as these browsers are. Um, and then it's flexible. So with uh, some of the frameworks out there, you have a very set path of where you can go. Angular gives you a lot of flexibility uh, building your application. It understands that there's this common pain point, but yet it understands that all of your applications have various different types of needs. So it goes through and tries to give you the flexibility to organize your code for what works best for your, your problems. And um, it's really easy to integrate with other JavaScript libraries. So for example, underscore or uh, jQuery widgets, um, any JavaScript library you can think of, it's pretty simple to integrate with, with Angular. Some JavaScript frameworks uh, make it very difficult to integrate with other libraries. Um, a couple of other reasons why I enjoy Angular and we use it for our projects, is that it gives us more than just the web platform. It enables us to also build applications for the desktop. So we can build small little applications in our um, web tool stack and push them using tools like NWJS or Atom Shell, which wraps HTML, CSS, and JavaScript inside a, a native window and allows you to send that as a Windows executable to the Windows folks to run or send it to a, a Mac or a Unix system to, to be run locally on the desktop. And using things like PouchDB, you can have a full data storage right there wrapped up in your desktop 
application with persistence and, and everything. So um, it makes it uh, much easier for web developers to stay in their same sort of uh, code stack and deliver uh, rich desktop applications. Um, the, the other one is mobile. And uh, using tools like PhoneGap and Ionic Framework, which underneath Ionic is the AngularJS framework, it makes it very easy to create hybrid um, applications for any mobile device out there. Now, some, some people think, well, that's great. Now I can create one application and serve it on all the platforms. But each platform has to be adjusted. So you can use the same source, but you probably need different applications. But still, the essence of Angular is embedded in all three of those platforms so that you can leverage your same uh, learning curve, if you will, of learning Angular and produce mobile, desktop, and web applications. So when I was giving this talk a few weeks ago, they asked, well, what about AngularJS 2? And um, I'm sure you guys have heard that AngularJS 2 is on the rise, and it's completely different than AngularJS 1. Um, and, and it's true. Uh, they, it, they should probably name it differently because it is going to be a completely new framework um, from one. But what I would recommend to you guys as you're just getting started is to really not worry about AngularJS 2 right now. Maybe read about it and try to understand it. But I would really focus on learning Angular 1.x, at this point 1.3 or 1.4. Um, and the, the guys of the core development team will provide a mi migration path to, to when 2 is ready. So if you're a crazy early adopter and you want to jump into 2 and you love lots of pain and lots of bleeding, um, go for it. <laughs> but if you want to get some stuff done, Angular 1 is plenty good enough and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things to do and a lot of great uh, stuff you can do with one. And it's fully supported. And um, as I'll show you at the, uh, the end of this talk, the resources and um, knowledge out there for AngularJS 1 is huge. So it shouldn't be any problem trying to figure out that. Whereas AngularJS 2 is in this state where um, it's still being refined. So, the AngularJS 2 that you learn today could be completely different um, three months from now or six months from now. So you'll have to keep up with that learning curve, and that can be very challenging. So that's the, uh, the what and the why. And, and now let's sort of focus on how. So uh, uh, I did a great job selling you guys on Angular. You're ready to get started. Where do you start? Well, the first place to start is with an HTML page, and you download the script, and you include that script in your HTML page. Um, now, you can also use uh, Bower or NPM, which is Node.js, to do it, and it'll help you do that. And there's several build tools like Grunt, Gulp, and uh, Yeoman that make this process easier. But really, um, to get started, all you need to do is download the JavaScript file and include it into an HTML page. And once you do that, basically your HTML script will look something like this, where you have your, your head, your body, and then in your script you have your AngularJS page. Now at that point, nothing's really happening on your application. So what you want to do is leverage some features that we'll go through in the next uh, 30 minutes. Um, and that's uh, two-way binding, HTML templates, controllers, services, and, and directives. Um, so two-way binding is probably the biggest thing, uh, uh, biggest feature of Angular. When you think of Angular, you think of this example um, where you can essentially have your, your scope or state shared on your code side and your presentation side. And, and wired together for two directions. So um, in this case, we've got uh, a, a variable called title 
And then in our HTML template, we're referencing that with the double curly braces. Um, and then we're also adding an input box and we're referencing with an attribute ng model that same variable. And then that allows us to share in real time from the DOM to our code our state. So Angular is taking care of hooking in the listeners, um, watching the DOM, watching your code, and making sure they're both in sync at the same time. And that's essentially two-way data binding. Um, and you'll see that, that that functionality makes it super easy to deal with the DOM in, in, your, in your code base. So HTML templates, um, when we just showed that example, you uh, probably saw a, let's see, a couple of interesting things in the HTML before I uh, showed you the previous one with just the script tag. Here we have the script, and then we have this attribute called ng-app, and then we have this other attribute called ng-init. These are custom attributes by the AngularJS framework that tell the AngularJS engine what to do. And, and, and actually, the ng app is a, a signal that says, hey, I want to take all of the HTML between the ng app and the end body tag and compile that as a template. So from, uh, from AngularJS's perspective, the enclosure of the body tag, all of that HTML is not HTML that's being directly interpreted by the DOM. It's actually being pulled or extracted out into uh, this compiler that will turn through that HTML and find all the AngularJS directives and find all the AngularJS information and then return a, um, a HTML back to the DOM that the DOM can understand. So uh, AngularJS uh, enhances HTML to work for dynamic applications when the original context or canvas of HTML was mainly for static web pages. So this compile step really enables you to build these dynamic applications. Um, in, in this example, we're starting with the body tag and we have ng app and we're giving it an application name and then we're putting a controller and each time we define a certain attribute in AngularJS, we're isolating that section as a declarative template for it to be applied to code on the other side. There's two steps in Angular. There's the compiling phase and the linking phase. So the first step I explained was the compile phase where it pulls all the DOM elements out and uh, uh, basically puts them in a, a context that Angular can understand. And then there's a linking stage that takes your code and your state and scope and connects that to that DOM and essentially um, uh, merges those two together to generate a DOM that the browser can understand. So I've been using the term directives and directives is a uh, concept that Angular uh, came up with, so it's another term you have to learn. And, um, and, and AngularJS does have a steep learning curve, um, but directives is one of the, the backbone concepts that you really need to understand. And basically, all it is is um, a way to create custom elements or custom attributes to tell AngularJS I want to attach this declarative markup to some code that I've written. So for example, the ng app directive, that is your initializer. So you'll notice that in AngularJS, there's not a dot start method to start your application or an init method that initializes your application. The ng app basically initializes the app and pulls all of that uh, HTML inside that body as a, as a template. 
There's several other directives that you'll see, ng init, ng class, ng model, ng repeat, uh, bind, and, and controller, et cetera. Anything that's prefixed with ng in your HTML template is an AngularJS directive. Now, the nice thing is, and we'll get into it in a little bit, that you can create your own directives. But with the built-in directives, they give you a lot of flexibility and power. Um, one of my favorites is the ng repeat. Um, and basically, the ng repeat is very much like a for in loop. So you have a list of items, and you want to show a list of line items in your DOM for that list of items. Um, in this example, you can use ng repeat to basically take an array, and I've got this array one, two, three, four, and I want to replicate line items down my DOM for each element and just show that number. So here I've got the same code in my example, and I'm listing one, two, three, four. Now with two-way data binding, if this array changes, the code changes with it. Or, or the DOM changes with the array. So as my array changes dynamically, my DOM or my template recognizes that and automatically updates. And that's, that's um, very powerful when you're reading in, let's say, a list of posts for a blog and you want to paint them and then something changes, you can take that change, just assign that to a variable in your code and then it automatically repaints itself. So um, there, there needs to be some glue between your, your data persistence layer or your business layer and your declarative layer or your template. And in, in what Angular uses the term controllers for is gluing those two pieces together so that your declarative template and your data business rule persistence side uh, can exchange and, and share information together in a controlled way. And it uses another concept or a term called scope or, or state. Um, scope represents that uh, area of memory between the template and the controller. So that if I uh, define a new variable in my controller called color, I use dollar sign scope and assign that object. And then in my template, I can use the double curly braces color to reference that variable. And, and again, it's both directions. So if I do an input and, and name that input's ng model value color, then it's going to dynamically set the scope on the other side. And you can see a simple example here. Uh, we've got color green in our controller. We change it to blue. And we'll show our output changes to blue. So this controller is declared as a template in my HTML. And then in my Angular module, I have a controller code block. Both of those are named foo control, which connects them. And then I have a scope object I set to color. And whatever I set that in my controller code is automatically applied to the template in the HTML. Make sense? Good. Using controllers allows you to separate bits and pieces of your application into several different simple code blocks so that you don't have one big long function that has a thousand lines of code um, to, to debug and to maintain. By using controllers, you can create small, little, discrete pieces of functionality and then compose them together with your declarative templates. So most applications that we create on an um, ongoing basis always require something of routing. And Angular introduces routing in a way that it doesn't include it in its framework but it gives you a add-on called ng-route. And there's also a great open source router, which I will uh, demo today, 
that is called Angular UI Router. And it's pretty much with uh, the current state of AngularJS 1.3 and 1.4, the suggested router to use and learn. Um, there's a new router coming out, but like I said, um, I, would, I would stick to what's been proven out there. And, and routing is, is essentially on a single page app. If you want to change the URL, the URL drives a different presentation in your DOM. And uh, in a single page app, since you're all on one page, you have to manipulate the HTML5 push state APIs to make that happen. And the, the router helps you do that. So in this routing example, we have state two, and if I click on state one, we route to state one. If I click on state two, we route back to state two. So that's what a router is. It allows you to build links and transitions between different templates. And as I was saying before, the, the UI router is the common router. And um, tomorrow in our workshop, we'll actually use the UI router in, in our workshop so you can get your hands on and see how that works. But basically, you have a view, a UI-view. This is your container. This is where all your templates will load. And then to link to that in your template, you just uh, provided a UI SREF and the name of the state that you want to transition to. So if I transition to foo, then this UI view will load the foo template inside it. If I transition the bar, the UI view will load the bar template inside it. In your code, Angular has a config section. In that config section is where you define each one of your states and the URL that it's going to map to the controller and the template that you want to, lot, um, to, to attach to. And with this state provider, you can go dot state and define each one of your states. And you can also define them in submodules as well. So you can break these up and have a submodule that has a set of states and another submodule that has a set of states and wire those up into your core application. But the, the API is pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, you can do a lot of neat stuff. One of the, the nice things about the UI router is that you can do nested routes. So you may have a top level route. And then inside <coughs> your template, you may have several child routes that you want to nest. And the UI router gives you that feature. The NG router does not. The last provider that's injected in the config is the UR route, URL router provider. Say that three times really fast. Um, and it's basically got a method called otherwise. And the otherwise just gives you the default route. So when the um, app is first initialized, uh, a user comes in and there's no route specified, that's the default route that it loads. So with routes comes views. And um, when you're dealing with views, they're just like small HTML templates uh, that, that you want to connect to and show in that UI uh, view block. So let's see if we can pull up a view. So here we have, like I showed you on the slide, a, a UI view, and then we have state one and state two. And then what we're using, and, and there's several ways to deal with AngularJS templates. You can have separate HTML files for your templates and reference them that way. You can have script elements, as I have here in this example, where we're saying script type text.ng template, and then we're putting our HTML inside that. And the, the DOM doesn't load those. Angular compiles those as separate functions inside of JavaScript. Or you can actually have it as a separate string inside your JavaScript library and, and inject templates that way. So Angular gives you a lot of flexibility on how you build uh, these, these views. Um, but the, the result is the same. So here we have state one, 
we click state two, and we're transitioning between the two. We've defined our templates, and if we look in our JavaScript, you can see here in the state provider that I'm setting state one, and I'm setting state two, and I'm telling it to load this template URL, state one, which it finds in the state one script tag, and I'm telling it to load state two, which it finds in the state two uh, script tag. And then I've got a couple of controllers that I connect with my templates. Does that make sense? Good? Uh, return the full screen. Yay. So what we've been talking about so far are just the um, presentation side, and that's sort of the core pieces of Angular, but it does have a services side. And the services side uh, leaves you with a lot of flexibility. So a, a model in Angular, if you think of the common model view controller architecture, a model in Angular can be a string, can be a number, can be a JavaScript object, can be a JavaScript array. Pretty much anything in JavaScript can be a model in AngularJS. Um, which gives you a lot of flexibility how you define your services. Most of the time, you create a factory, and, and that factory builds a singleton that provides your controllers a set of shared services for a given domain. For example, widgets. And, and in that widgets factory, you may have, a, um, you may have an all method, and then you may have an add method. And then you may have an edit and an update. Um, so uh, in, in that factory, you put all of your, your data connecting code um, as a service. And then in Angular, you can inject that service into your controllers. As I'm injecting this widget service into a list controller and an add controller. And I'm showing both controllers on the same page. And when I um, have these connected, now they both read from the same data source. So now when I go to my add controller and add a new value, it immediately binds to the list controller and displays the new value. So by leveraging services for your data and your business rules, you can remove a lot of unnecessary code in your controllers and your controllers can focus just on um, setting the state of the application for that given template. And finally, uh, custom directives. Custom directives, just like we were going through some of the built-in directives, custom directives makes you an HTML author. So you can create your own HTML elements, and then Angular will take those and replace those. Um, it's a, it's a great power, but it also comes with great responsibility. So I would, if you're just getting started with Angular, I would not create custom directives unless you have a really, really good, unique case. And you know that you're going to reuse it over and over. Um, because you can really get um, into a mess with custom directives if you don't really understand them very well. Um, but, but basically, they allow you to create your own elements in HTML. So here, I've created my own HTML tag that should be in HTML6, I think, foo-bar, right? Um, and I can put that in my HTML template, and then I can go into Angular and my code and define that as a directive. And if you notice, in my template, I'm saying foo-bar, and in my directive, I'm saying foo capital B bar, uh, a camel case. So in HTML, snake case always translates to camel case. And snake case is the dashed, and uh, camel is the first letter of the first word is lowercase, and then each word after that is uppercase. So by doing that, that convention tells Angular that this is a new HTML element, and I'm going to look at this directive, and I've got a restriction on it that it can only be an element. 
I can make that restriction to be an attribute, I can make it be a class, or I can make it be all three. So I can put in a restriction and say E for element, A for attribute, and C for class, and it can be all three of those things in my HTML template. Here we're just doing an element. And then we've got another concept called transclude. And it's actually a real word, but uh, uh, basically what that means is I want in my template, I want uh, some markup to be inside my start and stop tag that I want to ingest into my directive and manipulate it in some way. In this case, we are transcluding the text beep, bop, boop. <laughs> um, and, and we're transcluding that. And then in our directive template, we have an ng transclude. So we're basically saying, we're telling Angular, we want to take all the input that's inside that foobar closure and we want to wrap that in an h1 tag. And for that result, we should get beep boop. And then as a user of this directive, I should be able to change any of the elements inside my new HTML element, and it should render based on what I have given it as a directive. Make sense? All easy stuff, right? <laughs> Good. So the last thing I want to talk about today is unit testing. Because Angular focused its design based on unit testing, um, it's, it's very easy to test your code. And, and not only test your, your controllers, but also test your directives. And it uses a tool called Karma that runs those tests. And it can run with any kind of testing framework, which is a whole nother discussion, but the built-in one is Jasmine. Uh, and, and Jasmine uses a text, describe before each, it, and it spec. So um, using this model, you can quickly build uh, tests for controllers, for directives, for filters, all kinds of things. And Angular builds a, another tool called ng-mock. And ng-mock gives you methods like inject, which makes it uh, very easy to um, inject your module into your test and then inject a controller or inject a directive. And then it's uh, in the test. And then um, you simply expect that um, object and, and, and make sure that it's equal. So, so it's very much like if you come from uh, Ruby background with, with RSpec is very much built off of RSpec style of, of testing and, and very easy to run. Very easy to run against several browsers. So Karma gives you the tools to say, hey, I want to run it against Firefox, Safari, and uh, Chrome. And it will run the test in every single browser for you automatically. Um, and it's super easy to connect to third-party testing services like Sauce Labs and Testling to run your test as well. So that's just a little glimpse of some of the features in AngularJS. Um, there's a lot more, and there's a lot of information out there on how to get started. This, uh, this GitHub user, Mr. Cunningham, uh, put together this uh, awesome page of resources. So instead of trying to put my own, I am um, borrowing his, and it gives you um, a very exhaustive list in, in several different languages for anything you could possibly want to know about AngularJS, um, from books, videos, courses, uh, all the way down to blog posts, everything. Um, so I would recommend get these slides and start going through this and choosing the right way that um, you feel like you learned the best. And this is a great way to get started. Come to my workshop tomorrow, and we'll actually get hands-on and actually build a simple AngularJS application. Um, and, and at any time, 
come up to me or uh, hit me up on Twitter, and I'll be happy to help you navigate um, learning AngularJS because some of this stuff can just be overwhelming where you start. But the key to learning anything is know how you learn the best. Um, so if you're a book kind of learner, get the books. If you're a video guy, do the videos. If you need um, hands-on instruction or instruction, there's several, um, there's several training shops in, the, uh, in, in South Carolina where you can go locally and get that. We have Code Camp in Charleston. Um, ITology has a number of training classes here, and Greenville also has a, a number. So it's, it's not hard to find some help with Angular. And uh, w with that, I'll be glad to try to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. So uh, the question is, earlier we were talking about Elm that compiles um, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript uh, into a front-end browser. And here I'm talking about Angular. What's the difference between those two? Is that fair? Um, so Elm is a full functional language, a full functional platform. So when you go to write Elm, you're not thinking in HTML or CSS or JavaScript. And, and uh, maybe uh, um, Andy could, could help elaborate or correct me if I'm wrong, but pretty much you're working in a functional platform. And then you compile that, and the output is uh, a web application, right? So um, you may be familiar with uh, Google's Web Toolkit, where you basically write an application in Java, and then you compile it, and then it converts everything in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But you would probably not go in there and edit that directly. Whereas Angular is a little bit closer to the metal. So you're actually working in HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and it just creates a slight abstraction to remove the pain points of adding listeners to the DOM, studying the DOM to see what changes, and, and those things. It removes that grunt work from you. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, AngularJS and KnockoutJS are very similar. Um, KnockoutJS was first, and it was one of the first ones to introduce uh, two-way data binding. So the, the question was, what's the difference between AngularJS and KnockoutJS? Um, KnockoutJS was the first ones to really sort of start, in my knowledge, to, to introduce two-way data binding. One of the things with KnockoutJS um, is that it was focused around the .NET community, so it didn't get a lot of traction. It's still very good. It's a very good framework. Um, and I would say it's a little bit lighter than Angular. Angular has a little bit more opinionation in it. Um, but uh, the, the other side, the, I think one of the biggest differences between a lot of the frameworks and Angular is the, the size of the community and the uh, contributions for the open source community. AngularJS has exploded in the open source community. Um, there's tons of third-party modules. Um, there's tons of resources to learn. It's, it's just really, really massive um, how quickly it's grown uh, to, to its front. So the community is probably the biggest part of separation between these JavaScript frameworks and style. Uh, Angular has a lot going for it today. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, with Angular 2, um, is there any concern that Angular 1 is going to get phased out anytime soon? 
And, and I think, you know, the answer is time will tell. But for, from my knowledge is uh, that Angular 1.5 is the release that they're planning to be a transition or a migration to 2. So if you stick with 1 and you keep your code up to date to Angular 1.5, then you should have a good story to move into Angular 2 when, when you're ready. Um, on the other side, the drastic change is like two separate products. And if you look at software in the past, um, Angular 1x will probably be around a lot longer if you look at our history than when 2.0 is production ready, right? And, and I think um, the core team has made it very clear that they plan to uh, maintain both um, for a, a good period. Now, what does that mean in JavaScript years? Could be two weeks. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think you're, you're good to stick with, actually, you're probably better off learning 1x today and not worrying about 2 um, until it gets closer to ready. Because if you look at, if you go back and look at Angular 0.9, and the 1.0 and the difference in DSLs and concepts and all of those things, it's radically different. A lot of people that wrote their apps in 0.9 and had in production, they didn't even bother to upgrade to 1.0 because it was so much change. So, so they're looking at that lesson and they're trying to keep up, but still Angular 2 right now is in alpha mode and what that means is they can change that API at any point in time. So if you get into that, if you get on that train, you're going to be stuck on that train changing, and you probably don't want to be a, a 2.0 release candidate one and stuck not being able to go to full 2.0 because the pain's too much. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Have a great day. Enjoyed it.